And we are live. Welcome everybody to today's meetup. Great to have you here. I see the Zoom meeting filling up. Welcome. Hey, Kasper also. Good to have you here, Kasper. Hello, Christoph. Great. Yeah. So for everybody that already joined, um, feel free to familiarize yourself with Zoom. Um, feel free to share your name. Uh, feel free to say hi in the chat. Maybe share the location where you're in just to see how international um, the crowd is. If you, if you say hi in the chat, make sure to select everyone before saying hi, because otherwise only Kasper and I will read this. Great. Olivier from France, nice. First one, good. <laughs> Germany, Brazil, Latvia, New York, Spain. Cool, yes, we do have an international crowd. Um, very good. I'm glad to have you all here. Um, Kevin, yeah, maybe maybe you should also select to everyone before, before sharing. Um, otherwise, hi to Nebraska, um, Ireland, Spain, great. Denmark, very good. Um, yeah, Yin, Yin Hong, please also make sure to select to everyone before, before sharing in the chat. Cool, so maybe before we get started, a um, few housekeeping rules. Um, this meeting is being recorded. As you can see, we'll share the recording with you tomorrow um, in an email together with some links, um, useful links. Uh, I think at least a link to the um, article that you wrote, um, Kasper. Um, if you have any questions um, in between, just feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, most of you found that already, um, or put them in the Q&A section, um, whatever works better for you. The Q&A section has the advantage that questions don't get lost. So it might be the better place um, to put questions and then I'll be happy to ask Kasper in the end or interrupt him. And with that, I think uh, we're good to go. Um, so again, welcome everybody um, to this meetup. Great to have you all here. Um, I'm Christoph, I'm your host tonight, um, and uh, it's great to be here with you, Kasper, again um, today. Um, and there's a, there's a reason for, for this meetup, because um, you wrote an article on 10 fallacies in platform engineering, and that resonated very well with the community. We got a lot of, I saw a lot of comments and discussions going on, so I thought that's a great topic for a meetup. So I'm um, glad to have you here, um, and I'm really excited to, um, to hear more from you as an author um, on these 10 fallacies. And then let's see, maybe we can have a discussion um, in this Zoom meeting. And, and I would love that. And thank you so much for having me, Christoph, and uh, for everybody to curving out some time to, to listen to this. Platform engineering, you know, um, maybe is very close to my heart. Uh, it's, a, it's a new trend, um, it's accelerating very, very quickly. If you look at um, any of the communities, you'll, you'll get a sense for this. But it's also a space that's very new um, and has been kept to some very exclusive companies, um, Google, Spotify, lots of different teams that that had the capacity to do that. And now it's really going mainstream. So um, I, I mean, uh, very quickly on, on myself, um, I've been working in this space for quite a while. I'm, I, I wrote uh, like a lot <laughs> by now and uh, I'm contributing to, and that's actually open so everybody can contribute. And if you have ideas, please contribute. Um, internal developer platform.org and platform engineering.org. And then there's the platform engineering Slack where we had very healthy conversations around this topic and there are all the meetups and then there is very exciting. Uh, you're the first to hear this because it's not officially announced platform con and um, the first conference row and it's, I think it's uh, happening in June. So if you want to speak, uh, registrations are still still open. I'll be definitely I'll definitely be there. Um, and um, I'm obviously also working on Humanitech. So you know, I, if I go to bed at night, I, I think about nothing else but platforms. Um, and so um, it, it also means that I, I speak with a huge amount of different organizations um, about these topics. Some of them are actually here uh, tonight. A brief shout out to uh, Matteo, who's <laughs> a very loyal um, attendee here and, and, and um, also somebody 
I, I'm working closely with in terms of platforming in general. So good to have you here, Matteo. Um, but um, and, and that means I see a huge amount of different setups. Uh, I can put a number on that. Last 12 months, I just saw the report, 249 organizations that I looked at. And I'm already at the point where some people say certain constellations of things and say, like, in our team, we're currently discussing, and I can say, aha, okay, in your situation, you are probably having this in this discussion. Well, you're actually falling for a fallacy. And after I've did that so many times, I thought, ah, I have to write something about this. And so I wrote this really long article uh, around the 10 fallacies, and it resonated really well, which I'm very grateful for. And um, I really just wanted to, to use this webinar. For the first time um, that I'm, I'm, this is a first time presentation, I've never done that. Um, and so um, I wanna go through these fallacies really. But before we, um, yeah, and so that's exactly what we wanna do. I, I, before we do that, I, I, I very briefly want to put a level playing field on the platforming discussion. Why are we doing this? And how is the platform space evolving? Again, it's early days for platforming. You are, if you're in this meeting, um, at the forefront of the industry, I can tell you that. Um, and it means that you're thinking about a lot of the same things that I'm thinking about. And so I wanna give you, and I'll do this at every webinar now, um, my current understanding of the space and this view is evolving. And if you disagree, please tell me. All right, so I think what's pretty obvious is that the like there are lots of um, lots of waste happening at the moment, and it, it, from all of the data we have, and you know that we are doing also a lot of benchmarking reports, around twenty five percent of the team's um, capacity is wasted on uh, lots of these things. But that's in particular because everything has become vastly more complex. If you compare, and was one of the problems that we do as an industry that we compare ourselves to 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Well, if you compare these, the, 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 our work has become significantly more complex. Cloud native is not the brave new simple thing that it was meant to be. Uh, it is fairly complex. Uh, average application is 25 times more different services and components. If you compare that to 2010, uh, you have a lot more specialized tools. Um, everything is going wrong all the time. We had Okta this morning or yesterday. Um, and everything is getting more complex. We're shipping globally. 17% of you are multi-cloud. It's not easy, right? And we are under a lot of pressure to deliver. There aren't enough engineers. Um, and that means um, we have to simplify. How do we simplify at the moment? Well, we're basically taking scripts and we're just throwing lots of manual work at it. Developers can choose from two evils. Do I do stuff myself? Means I need a lot of context. Do I um, ask a central operations team to do that? And what we're usually seeing is that that means developers wait for stuff to happen or they're overwhelmed or, uh, it leads to something that I call um, shadow ops, where the senior developers take uh, um, the job of central operations, and then operations is very often ticket ops and drowning. And this is why teams then actually say, okay, we have to platform. Why do they platform? Well, for the application developers, they want to have less cognitive load, right, without being a step away, with a high degree of self-service, so they are less dependent on the SREs uh, or the platform team or the DevOps. And um, they want that without breaking the workflow. And then the, the platform team or the SRE team, they want to drive standardization by design. By design means I'm building stuff that then as people use it by design uh, standardizes, they want to reduce ticket ops and they want to focus quite frankly, as we all want to. Okay, so how do I currently think about this platforming space? Um, and this is maybe a little bit adjacent to this, um, to this uh, conversation, but I, I think it's really important. Um, let's, uh, first of all, I, I think that the sum of all the components is the internal developer platform, right? Everything together is an internal developer platform. There is the flow component of a team. The team is coding with an IDE. They're merging in a version control system. They're using CI to build stuff. Then modern dynamic platforms usually have something like a platform controller or a platform API or a platform operator to dynamically create the application model to, um, to do the deployment usually, to do um, all of the governance and the manage the intersection of all of that. 
and it then makes its way into the infrastructure where it's running. And then there are a number of interfaces. There is the service catalog, for instance. Um, good examples are Lina X. I, I had a demo with them last week or Backstage or Snow from ServiceNow. If you are a, um, it, that, that is more on the enterprise side, then an interface could be observability, which is pulling run through data from the platform controller. Then you usually have other interfaces that are just focused on the operations of an application. I call them app ops, CLIs, app ops, UIs, basically like Heroku's, but on top of your infrastructure, you have fully code-based models, application model, um, or you have strictly RP based and all of those things in combination, they are your internal developer platform. Um, so again, very new space, lots of the wordings is still being figured out. Mm. And if you have any ideas, I would love for you to contribute here. Okay. Yeah. Chris, Musa uh, also, I think, um, asked exactly that in the Q and A. So he asked, sorry, <laughs> um, if this question is basic, can you please define what platform engineering is? I hope that this answered your questions, uh, your question, Musa. If not, feel free to place a follow-up question. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So all of us are starting to platform the digital world. My take is whoever invests in being a platform engineer today will be very, very sought after in five years. This, like the speed at which this is accelerating is just, is just insane. Um, and um, there actually, if you are interested in, in these jobs, uh, there's a job part of the Slack. I think there will be also a job board on platformengineering.org. Anyhow, but um, so we're digitizing the, the, we're platforming the digital world. And I can see because it's such a new trend, a lot of people fall into certain traps, follow certain fallacies. And now I wanna guide you through the most common fallacies that I am observing in my work. Again, we're looking at, I'm overlooking roughly 249 to be precise, uh, setups last year. Those are anything from 50 developers to 3000 developers uh, that I'm working with, just to give an idea what we're talking about. Okay, number one, and this issue is, if I say number one, and I should probably for for to have more drama, I should have put that to the last one. But I, I actually show you the most important fallacy, the most the, the what people get the most wrong, and then we'll get into the uh, important but less important elements. And next time I will uh, swap that around uh, to add more drama to the conversation. Anyhow, the prioritization fallacy. We're thinking about enabling self-service for our developers. We are thinking about standardization. We are thinking about platforming. We've heard um, Gregor Hope from Amazon Web Services say, platform is the most important thing you can do. He's writing a ter terrific um, blog, uh, um, book on it. And we're getting our, uh, uh, finding our path into that. And then what I usually see people do is that they say, well, uh, what is the workflow? How do I think about this? Where do I start? Where does life of an application start? Well, when it's created. And then the, the most, most often people go in and say, hmm, I will now optimize the way new services get created. And that is very noble, right? But the question that you have to ask ourselves, <coughs> and we have to ask ourselves, does that actually move the needle? In me optimizing the creation time of a service, is that, is, where, is that where I should actually allocate my time? The answer in almost every case, and I'm, I, 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 I hate to break that because I know that many people think about this, the answer in almost every case is no. Optimizing for service creation will probably not move the needle in terms of your return on investment of the time you spend as a platform engineer. Why is that the case? Well, and in order to answer this, and we'll share this data after the conversation with you via email, we ask 1,850 teams, take 100 deployments. How often do you do things that go beyond the simple update of an image? Because um, normal CI pipelines, that's the one thing that they do very well, update an image, test an image. But let's say we want to do things that go beyond the update of an image. <coughs> Those could be things like adding an environment variable, changing configurations, refactoring, 
um, spinning up a new environment, onboarding developers, um, changing resources, all of that. And then we ask if you have that, the percentage in regards to 100 uh, deployments, um, how much time is included for the developer and how much time is included for the operations teams. And what you can see is that um, you will need certain things a lot, like configurations, for instance, and other things you don't need very often. And so <coughs> what I see most people get wrong is that they uh, focus on the creation time, where what they actually should focus on is the app operations. But this is something that is individual for all of you. I can't give you a definite answer what you should focus on. I, and I even think it's very dangerous to listen to speakers and say, that's what he said, that's what uh, she said, that's what I should do. Uh, do. Um, so I, I would encourage you to think of it like um, a, a, as follows. Take 100 deployments, and you can ask anyone in your team, like and ask a diverse group. That's another fallacy we'll get into. And ask them, hey, 100 deployments, how often do you do these things? And you'll be very surprised. And you'll get very precise answers. And this is how you can actually build your case. Don't fall for the fallacy of doing the most obvious thing, which is the first step. That might not be the most clever thing to do. So that is fallacy number one. Fallacy number two is the visualization fallacy. And I'm actually showing you a picture of a magnifier looking at a pile of shit. Why am I doing this? Because um, uh, Lee Ditian King, um, who built the platform at a variety of really interesting companies, wrote a great article that I encourage you to read called Why Putting a Pane of Glass on a Pile of Shit Does Not Solve Your Problem. The next huge problem that I'm observing every single time is that management says, oh, let's solve all our problems by building nice dashboards. I have almost never seen any tangible results from having nice dashboards. That might work if you're in a sales organization and it might work if you, I don't know, have a, I don't know. But in most cases, it doesn't really move the needle. Just visualizing something, just surfacing something is something that in the end, if you really look at usage, nobody would really look at and nobody will really use and you will just waste a tremendous amount of time sinking this into. If you have all of the data and you're just uh, spinning up something and you're visualizing something really quickly, well then do it for God's sake, but focusing your entire energy, which I see a lot on visualizing things, that might not be the best use of your time. All right. Now, the next fallacy here, the wars you cannot win fallacy. And this is unfortunately something that is um, you could apply to a lot of situations um, in March 2022. But if we keep to the, uh, to the software engineering space, then what I mean is make sure you pick the right conversations. Um, I've seen a good amount of platform teams that say, Oh yeah, we don't like that the fact that one team has Jenkins, the other one has Circle CI, and the third one has GitHub Actions, and we want them to all move to Jenkins. Well, what they usually move to is GitHub Actions, um, or they are on Azure DevOps. By the way, um, brief hint: uh, Azure DevOps is probably sunsetting and merging into GitHub Actions. Do not uh, jump on the Azure DevOps train wagon. I've just heard that, but anyhow, you get what I mean. Consolidating your CI pipeline might also not really move the needle. You have to see, again, ruthless prioritization, what actually makes sense. And then there are certain things in the, um, in the setup of engineering teams and frankly, in the psychology of us as engineers, that you have to be make a very, very clear case for them why you're actually changing the workflow. And usually you can bring a consolidating angle like a platform controller that is post CI that consolidates the images coming from the CI. And so the individual team still own CI and you have, don't have to deal with this. CI is only one example. There are a good amount of other things for just as a basic um, idea, try not to change or change as little on the workflow as possible. And always make sure, I learned that the hard way, that there is an immediate benefit for the individual user. So you don't actually fall for the tragedy of the comments. 
Platforming is a little bit like climate change. It has to make sense for the individual developer or your platform strategy will most likely not work. All right, then here, um, that's also a great one, the everything and everybody at once fallacy. Now, to understand this very nice picture here, you have to uh, speak German, which uh, this, um, in German, we have a saying, Eierlegende Wollmichsau, which is a pig that is at the same time giving, like providing meat and milk, but also eggs. And so a lot of the platforms that I'm observing are doing a tremendous amount of things, right? And they are not only doing a tremendous amount of things, they're also then rolling out this thing that can do a tremendous amount of things to everybody at once. Again, this will not work and it's probably not a very good idea. The platforming strategies that I've seen work out is envision how you see the future. What is your future platform? How does that look like? Let's say we believe that in two years, our company should be 90% containerized and it should run on a managed Kubernetes provider with EKS. We want to use as many managed services as possible. So RDS is our database of choice, Cloudflare, our cloud provider, uh, our DNS provider, all of those different things. Once you have that figured out, like just sunset the idea of building a platform that spans VM to serverless. If, if anybody would have figured that out, this person would be very, very rich now. Nobody figured it out. And that's why in that space, at least, nobody is really rich because of that reason. So come up with this clear idea on how your optimization looks like in the future. What is your platform of the future? Then do not move this with a big bang. Also has something to do with the next fallacy. Instead, find a small team of evangelists, a team of six, seven users, maybe two teams that are always the ones that adopt the 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 spare the the the, the optimal that, that are very very. Um, happy to actually um, innovate, early adopters if you want. Work with them to really get this perfect. And this is um, uh, then actually um, something that rolls over into the next fallacy, build something that is actually better. Because if you don't, if you're not careful with this fallacy and you build too much at once for too many people, then you are actually running just into the next fallacy. And that is the fallacy of the new setup isn't better fallacy. If you are proclaiming, hey, we're the platform team and we are going to deliver a developer experience that is unparalleled. And you work with these two teams and then you deliver something that might be better for you as an organization because it drives more standardization but there is no material difference for the developer or even worse, it includes a learning curve and it makes things harder and it breaks the workflow, then you're lost. And so you have to build things by focusing on these small user groups that is incrementally better or it solves an individual pain of the user that is really pressing. What could be an individual pain of the user that is really pressing? Well, users at the moment, developers, have a config break between local environments and cloud environments. Let's say Docker Compose, Minikube, and then you have to deal with Helm charts. Imagine you find a way of actually getting that abstracted away. There is only one model. It's cloud agnostic, and it will be converted through the reference implementation into Docker Compose files or manifests. By doing this, you are also driving standardization for the entire organization. This is actually an example where both things pan out well. You have the individual user who has an immediate benefit. The immediate benefit is, oh, wow, I don't have to manage all of these configs across all of these environments. I just have this one model and it works. 
And for the platform team, for the organization, you're driving standardization by design because you're now in the world of dynamic configuration management uh, where you can really make sure that you are um, keeping things tidy if you want and you can build a great platform experience. So make sure you don't do everything at once. Make sure you select a subset, a subgroup of people and make sure that what you're building and what you're getting them is better than what they have right now while making sure that it is better for the individual user. Good, Abstract and fa abstraction fallacy. That is um, one where, that most people have at the back of their head if they're thinking about platforming, whether or not to platform. Um, the platforms of the early 2010s where platforms very often because of lack of resources, lack of experience, all of that, where you needed to do something as a developer and it would work in 90% of the cases. But as developers, we're a little bit like users of um, Alexa. We hate Alexa or voice recognition until they have an accuracy of 99%. Because the 1% really fails like a pain in the ass. Now, that's the same thing for platforms. And I'm not saying that you need to cover everything. The opposite is the case. But you have to, you, it's completely okay for the platform to fail. But you have to be able as a developer to understand why it fails. Observability is very important. And, the, and giving people full transparency is also very important. Sounds cryptic, let me give you a very tangible example. Let's say we design a CLI, and the CLI is doing um, sample CLI create S3 of type um, of type Christoph. Now the CLI goes off and creates and actually executes a Terraform file to give you a certain S3 bucket as an example. You get the S3 bucket. There's something wrong with with the S3 bucket. In 99% of cases, that is not a problem, but in 1% of cases. You're sitting there and you're, you don't know whom to ask and you have no idea what's going on. So a bad abstraction is you have the CLI, something happens under the hood. And if it goes wrong, you have, you're, you're basically stuck. A good abstraction is you have your CLI and as one of the output returns, it says, hey, this is the repository of the parameterized um, Terraform that we're actually calling have a look to understand what's happening under the hood. And here are the error logs from Terraform. And if you have a problem, you can send a pull request or this is the team that's responsible. So this is a great example. It's not complex, but we have to keep in mind that we should never abstract something. We can never take context away from the developer. That is very, very important. And again, it doesn't make it doesn't make the implementation more complex. You can do, you can build great platforms with very little overhead right now. You just have to make sure you do it the right way. All right, that is one of my favorite. That could be my little son. It's not for privacy reasons. Um, also, he's half a year older. But that's the loudest voice fallacy. And I'm also seeing that everywhere. The loudest voice fallacy means you're sitting down with your team. And you're saying, hey, um, we want to standardize more. We want to give more self-service. We want to make sure that we don't take so much effort from you in operating your application. What's a good way of us to do this? Could we maybe build a CLI that just calls a Terraform file? Now, the, lawyer, the loudest voice in this situation is usually the most confident developer. And that is usually a... Linux kernel hacker loves Terraform, is all over it, and is allocating significant amounts of time because it's maybe good for his or her career, whatever. So this person will get up and say, hey, I don't want to have a CLI in front of this. I can do all of that myself. I don't want to hear about this uh, ever again. This is the way we want to optimize this. That's one opinion, but it's probably one opinion of many other opinions. Now, as engineers, and I'm, I have that exact same thing with myself, 
we feel somewhat, um, it feels somewhat awkward to stand up to somebody who is more knowledgeable in a certain field and say, hey, this might be the case for you, but I actually feel very insecure if it comes to this particular thing. Now, then um, that is a systematic problem because now as we're asking people, hey, what do you want? The loudest voice will shout at us and say, I want to have this, bam. And that means that very many setups are optimized for the strongest link in the chain and not for the weakest link. You should actually work on making the weakest link more strong through education. And you should actually work on listening very careful to that weakest link and design for um, this case. Now, how do you do this? Well, it's a little bit like user research. Manuel Pais is always saying, and that, that really resonates with me, treat your platform as a product. That means you have to do user research. That means you have to speak with people individually, basically. Take the loudest voice, understand what she or he wants, take the, um, take the backend team, take the frontend team, take the PM, gather their requirements and come up with the common denominator. All right. Then we have the freedom fallacy. The freedom fallacy means if you leave a tremendous amount of choice, that is great, but you're not really doing anyone a favor. Nothing is wrong with what we call golden paths. And golden paths means give best practices, combinations that actually work, but make sure that Again, no abstraction and very little abstraction. People can deviate from this path um, as, as simple as possible. If you give people 280 ways to spin up Cloud SQL, right, through various options, nobody is really winning. I, if, you, if I'm very concentrated, I can come up with maybe five, maybe maximum 10 ways of spinning up Cloud SQL that make a material difference from a cost or performance perspective. So make sure you don't overdo it. There is no value. Things don't get better only if there are more of it, right? That's, it holds true for a lot of things. It also holds true for um, software engineering. The next thing is all of us are used to listen to glorious talks of how Netflix, Facebook, and Google are organizing their engineering teams. Good for them, but the reality looks really different. Just to give you an idea, GitHub has 104 full-time, no, that's not true, 46 full-time equivalents on their platform. Zalando, Europe's largest online retailer, has 104. If you listen too much to what they're saying, the chances of you actually designing your system in the wrong way are very high. I want to remind all of us of the Spotify squad model, which works in some cases and doesn't work in very many other cases. If you are listening to Netflix, who's optimizing for one or two new microservices every day, and because of that, you're optimizing the creation of microservices, then that is probably not a very good idea. And that doesn't mean that as an industry, we cannot adapt a lot of the things that they do. But it also means we have to be very, very, very careful to understand how this works. Because the reality is that the platform teams I work with have maybe only one person, maybe four. Maybe they have 10 or 20, but they definitely do not have 104. So we need to develop platforms that are quick and dirty, that just do the job reliable, and that work for the specific situation that we're in. And that means we're resource constrained and we cannot throw endless um, money at the problem, really. All right. Now, last one. Don't compete with AWS fallacy. Also very important. You can't, there's not even that much to, to, to say about that. But from there, there is very little reason on very little data that suggests that it makes sense to compete as an individual company that has completely different business objectives, 
with uh, the capacity of somebody like AWS or Google or Azure, whatever. If they come up with something that works, it's really hard for me to say it myself, but mold your stuff to actually deal with these things. Great article from Gregor Hoppe. He wrote that before he joined AWS, by the way, I wanna line that out. And um, that says, don't get stuck in um, avoiding lock-in, I think. Don't get locked in, avoiding lock-in. And that is very clever. The life cycles we're talking about, and, and this doesn't hold true if you're a financial service company, there are actually laws in the States, all of that, I agree. But in a lot of cases, don't be afraid to, to just dump and actually jump and actually adopt best practices and, and, and tools. All right. That was a fairly long talk. I think I have lost time, uh, 36 minutes. Thank you so much for listening. And I would love to debate this a little bit with you if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Kaspar. I love the pictures and the examples you gave. Really, really cool to see. Um, so we have, uh, if, maybe reminder for everybody, feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A section. We have one question um, from Gina. Um, thank you for this meetup. I'm new to the software development world. So help avoid these fallacies. Um, are there any software design strategies or frameworks that you can recommend? Are there any software design strategies or frameworks that you can recommend? Um, yeah, I mean, um, that is a very, very broad field. Um, I think the same holds true that I said around the platform, the platforming um, world. There are a lot of best practices. Let me give you a very, an example one doesn't want to hear as a developer. In the, um, in the sales world, now it gets awkward, in the sales force world, um, there are those teams that become really creative in the way they set up Salesforce because they say, well, I don't actually want um, my process to follow Salesforce. And then there are those teams. And from what I hear from salespeople, that those are usually the teams that are successful, that set up the process following Salesforce. What I mean by that is, Sometimes it makes sense to build processes that follow the tools at some point, if those tools are sufficiently large. Um, if we look at software design strategies, um, I think there are, there, is, um, there are great books from Gregor Hopper. We'll share a, a few with you individually. You can see that I'm a big fan of, uh, um, of Gregor. Enterprise uh, integration patterns, for instance, there are, um, I always recommend Martin Fowler on um, preventing microservices wherever possible, but then designing distributed systems the right way. Um, so yeah, there are lots of interesting material and we'll, we'll send some um, after the, the meetup. Cool, or books. That was the addition to the question, I think. And books. Um, Good. So we have a question from uh, Olivier. Um, if I have to build a platform from scratch, what would be the first steps? Oh, mm -hmm. good one. So first steps, gather your team and gather the team that you think those will be my innovators. Gather them, get them into a Zoom link, probably at this point. Um, and go ahead and then say, um, what's the target that we see most of the company be at? The answer will probably be container containers on EKS, <laughs> but whatever the answer is for you. Then sit together with them and say, okay, so now if we think about this thing, you're already working on that. Can we actually, um, can we, like, if we take our normal work day, we do a hundred deployments, how often do certain things happen? Okay, so in 100 deployments, this is how often we deal with configs. This is how often we spin up a new service. This, uh, is, this, uh, um, this um, is how often we actually onboard a new colleague. Then from there, you say, how much time does that take? You'll get a list and it will tell you how much time you allocate. And this list will actually be your prioritization schema. Just start with the one that um, gets you the highest ROI in the end. Once you have that, start scoping out. And what I'm observing is that it's usually 
the way infrastructure gets created and more often like how do you up deal with configurations how do you streamline configurations um, across the different um, service components mm -hmm. and then start to actually um, build a first lightweight CLI um, maybe look up uh, in the internet like what are good reference implementations for your specific situation and then um, build a basic prototype together with uh, the team that solves the pain point that has the highest degree of ROI um, and start testing that with this team as a starting point. Mm -hmm. And um, then from there, iterate and see what's the next thing that we can do and that we can reasonably bring to a point that is really convincing to the team um, and make sense for the individual user. Okay, cool. Understood. I think that hopefully also answered um, Neil's question. Um, so Lalit is asking, do you have any opinions on first, internal platform engineering documentation? And second, developer advocacy on internal platforms? Yeah, I think that is a great question. And I think it is very important that you think about advocacy, for instance, very early on. This team that we talked about, this design partner team, if you want, they are your champions. And they have to um, they have to live in a they have to be so convinced because it's so good what you've built that they are actually going out and rallying and saying, hey, I've I've been we've been working with this now. It is a material change. This is the future. You should jump on this train wagon. Very, very important. Um, and the, the same thing holds true for documentation. It has to be very easy to get started. The less Threat, the, the less um, time it takes for the individual developer to onboard, the more, the faster your adoption. That is the one-on-one -on, -one on enterprise SaaS B2B sales, which you've probably not been exposed to, but that is um, very important for internal platforms as well. Make mm -hmm. it as easy as possible to actually uh, jump, uh, jump on. Um, and that is done through good documentation. Uh, make, but, and they can be quick and dirty. Do like, loom videos how to do stuff um, build a slack space where you can just reach out if you have a problem jump on zoom calls with them in the end it's less than you think right just make sure you make it in a in a in a graphic way um quick and dirty show this thing in action something that people can 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 watch as a rule of thumb the the more value there is in it, in it for the individual developer, the more complex something can be. So if something is very complex, but it's also giving you a tremendous amount of value, then that is not a problem. You'll, you'll get very rapid adoption. The less the value for the individual, it could be very high value for the organization, but the less value there is for the individual, the, 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 um, the, the, the lighter the, um, the uh, onboarding has to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Kasper. Uh, I I skip your question, Niels, because I think we answered it already. But if I'm wrong, let Niels, me know. the exact same thing for hundreds yeah. of developers. I've been yeah. doing this for thousands of developers, mm -hmm. and it's the exact same thing. It's the exact same thing, right? Um, Jordi is asking, can you share your experience on organization structure? I mean, do you have a platform team department, or do you have some platform engineers in each development team product? So, Jody, that answer varies depending on your size. If you are an organization with two and a half, three thousand developers, then you have you might have several platform teams. There might be a platform team for the data world. There might be a platform team for something else. So you you cannot generalize my answer. And um, as a rough rule of thumb, I would say you have a platform team for for a thousand engineers, like up to a thousand engineers, starting from. Where does that make sense? Where does that make sense to start to build a platform? Actually, interesting question. My usual answer is 40, 50. Uh, was I frozen? No, it's good. Oh, good. Oh, good. Um, so my usual answer is 40, 50 engineers onwards. And then um, and then depending, if everybody is on containers with, with EKS, which is usually not the case, mm -hmm. although you can go up to 1,000 uh, developers or more, usually you have, um, uh, you, you petition them based on the, on the technology. Mm -hmm. um, and then, Yes, you should have a platform team. And 
a platform team sounds like a big thing. It's not actually true. Like um, that can be a single person, right? For a, for a smaller team. Absolutely, absolutely perfectly possible. And then you have a technical product manager who's taking over like a cross-functional role here, right? Um, but I recommend you having people that think of the, uh, the, the, the platform mindset. Platform is not DevOps. DevOps is the cultural, the, the cultural way of um, working together, delivering together. It's definitely not SRE, right? It's not infrastructure. Platform is about designing golden paths and designing combination of tools that drive standardization by design, that enable self-service. And these people basically built Heroku's internally. Um, those are much more software engineers. Um, and it's very important that that we um, also, and for the, for the entire category, by the way, uh, that, that we make that clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood. Um... Abilash, yeah, I hope I pronounced this name right, is asking, I'm new to this DevOps field. Um, do the platform engineering is a superset of DevOps and the subset of SRE? Yeah, I think I answered that. No. Yep, you answered that. Mm -hmm. um, Leo is asking, can you share your word of advice switching, changing platforms as your needs evolve or the market platform services change? What things should be considered? How possible is it? It's um, it's no. Uh, I can't. I, it's no extremely cost forbidding to change the ERPs or other core enterprise platforms. Um, what about these ones we are discussing today? So I think to formulate it with my words. So it's really expensive to exchange those kind of platforms. Isn't that the same for the platforms you are discussing here? Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I get what you mean. Um, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We have to stop thinking about platforms like an EIP. Um, there is no. There is no platform like Salesforce. There will be no Heroku for platforms. There will be no provider who says, "Hey, all of a sudden, everything will be done through us." The the world is too complex to meet the the uh, entropy of output, if you want. Um, your platforms will always be put together by different components. You will have a platform controller doing certain things. You have a service catalog that is helping you template. You will have, you will always have a CI pipeline. And this will be verticalized. We're always thinking about, oh, building a, the digital world is, is, there is some magic tool that can do everything. This, this is definitely not what will happen. There is, it's like, Think of the digital the digital process like a factory. There is no one tool that will build your, and I wanted to say Tesla, but I'm German, so I'll say Mercedes-Benz. There is no magical tool that will build your Mercedes-Benz. So, um, so the platform is the sum of its components and it has to be designed in a way you can swap those components and it evolves. It's a product. You are adding stuff and you, st you start with a more older static platform where you're using Argo CD to um, sync static files. You're evolving into a more modern platform where you are dynamically creating representations of the application uh, and deploying through a platform operator, and the the platform is more like a is is the sum of all of it. And the platform engineers bind these things together. We are developing a product. We're developing these platforms, um, and so we have to be able to swap mm -hmm. the individual pieces. Mm -hmm. I just I just connected this with your fallacy about don't compete against AWS because I think that's. That's also if, if AWS comes out with something that works included in your platform, right? Um, Definitely. And Werner Vogels is talking very fast at reInvent, <laughs> bringing lots of new stuff. That is true. So um, Janice is asking, it's very useful and insightful to listen to every individual of your team before start building any platform. However, um, is it possible to listen to some voices that might drive you to the wrong way? If so, how can we detect them? Yeah, yeah, that is actually an interesting question. So um, how can you detect them? Well, I mean, again, it's it's not identifying, it's, uh, it's building an average, if you want. And that is like you're building, I mean, all of you are building products. 
And if you want to understand, like, why do you build the product the way you're, you're building? And that's probably because you're listening to your users. And so then the question is always, as with every advice, and um, you'll go off tonight and you'll ask, hey, this customer guy, is this actually legit? Should I actually listen to what he's saying? So we always have to ma make up our mind, but um, a good proxy of people is overconfidence. If somebody is extremely confident and says, no, this is not the way it's done, and, -da -da -da, and I know exactly. And then you, you feel the other extreme. You feel that front-end developer who also is in that process of changing an environment variable, but they're thinking about completely different things. It's not that they have, they're less capable, but they're focused on TypeScript rather than um, Bash, right? And so you, it's very often making sure you listen to all of the roles that work on the same process and understand, hmm, okay, this person feels very confident. And if I talk to this person individually, they don't feel very confident. Well, you might want to optimize for the ones that don't feel very confident and tell the ones that are very confident to say, hey, this is a golden path. It's not abstracted away, very important. But we have to find a middle ground because this person feels very uncomfortable with what you're saying. Um, and that way uh, I found uh, this works very well. I recommend doing hackathons, for instance, that's cool, where teams sit together and um, they're like platform or workload hackathons. Uh, workflow hackathons. We do them internally at Humanitech, actually, where we say, hey, let's actually today just cover CI. How can we make CI better? How can we build dashboards that tell us what version is running in what environment right now uh, to help QA, whatever. But um, that's a great way of actually aligning this and then just sit there, listen to how these people talk, and you'll get your prototypes. I always like to say, uh, take individual people and say, aha, if I design this feature, I have you in mind as the super user who's very confident. And if I design this feature, I have you and I have this person in mind as the one who's actually focused on something else, but still has to use the process. Cool. Two last questions. Um, Olivier is asking, should a platform have its own API on top of its cloud provider? Uh, um, so I don't want to generalize that, um, Olivier. Um, I, I think that um, I believe this can be a good idea because it can streamline a lot of things. Again, only so far as you making sure you're not taking context away. Um, there is a good amount of new research that we that we that we have, um, and that I encourage you to read. Uh, it is around. I think we've just done a Kubernetes benchmarking report. The research um, says that in only seven to 11%, depending on whom you ask, people actually get access to the cloud console ever. Um, so that means that the, and that means that they inter still interact with the cloud APIs, but they usually do that with through infrastructure as code or something else. What I, what you can never, so it, what does that tell us? having access to like building an RP on the cloud or having access to the cloud itself doesn't really matter, right? What really matters is that you know what are what is caused by your actions. If you can have a single API for everything, but not only your cloud, also Cloudflare, also all of the different things. Again, remember 17% of us are multi-cloud. Everybody says that this is not a topic. It is a topic because some of us are financially regulated. Some of us work in China. Some of us work in, probably nobody of us works in Russia that much anymore, but um, you know what I mean, Saudi Arabia, whatever. So in order to really gain effect, you have, like this API has to be able to cope with all of those things. Um, and maybe that doesn't matter that much. What matters is that it is the best case. If it's possible, yeah, it's the best case. If not, what really matters in all cases is you give developers the context. They know exactly what's happening where. They know that if this get executed, this is the representation as code. I'm a big believer in representation as code at any point in time. Cool, understood. One last question, um, and I had to smile when I read it. So um, Yin Hong is saying, thanks for the great talk, super insightful. Good to see those struggles are outlined and discussed. 
One of our many platform challenges is mainly hiring enough experienced DevOps engineers to spread out to help applications teams deploy their applications properly. Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> hey, yeah, um, yeah, I have. So uh, now we're really derailing, but uh, it's still an interesting conversation. Um, so my experience is twofold. First, in hiring, most teams do a very bad job at explaining what will actually be done, right, in the job. Why is that, why is that actually cool? You're selling something, right? You are selling a job for somebody and the, the person does a tremendously large decision. They're allocating the most valuable thing that they have in life, their own time, to something, right? And so what well, you're you're basically trying to sell something that's very valuable to people and you need to do a better way at explaining why it matters for them to apply. Those are very subtle things and um if we do if if we do job descriptions I I go back and I go back and I go back and I try to make a very good job at explaining this. In platform engineering this is such an interesting thing, right? So if you if you work at a company that has already realized that, that platform engineering is a transformative thing, then you, you offer the chance for people joining to build something that can be career defining for them. Because from all I can see, nothing is more sought after than platform engineers right now. So you wanna make sure that this is actually communicated there. Then second, it's not enough to build good content. By the way, the more content you have, the better. Content that outlines that you are doing something new. You also have to get the word out there. Getting the word out there does not mean sending that to your talent acquisition team. Because your talent acquisition team is completely overwhelmed and they will probably just throw it against the normal channels. Like really become like really get creative and think about, hey, can I maybe go into Reddit? Can I maybe look at the Slack channels? Can I start to look at interesting profiles and engage with them individually? It's really simple. The more people you get into the process and you want to bombard your acquisition people, bombard them with, with hundreds of, um, of, uh, of applications, because the more the higher the likelihood of you having interesting conversations. And if I hear people that are saying, oh, nobody applies, that probably means that your process suck or you're not really looking into that a lot. We, I mean, we are in a privileged situation. We have hundreds, four, 500 applications for every role at um, Humanitech. So I'm, that might sound a little um, coming from me, might not be the, the most representative thing, but I've seen that in, you can do, most teams that I see can do a much, much better job at these two things. Those are nice last words, Kasper, for this meetup. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for walking us through these um, 10 fallacies. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. I hope you had a good time. Um, as I said in the beginning, we will follow up tomorrow. We'll share the recording. We'll share the links uh, that Kasper mentioned. I, I hope I have them all. I try to write them down um, while listening. Um, so um, have a great time. If you have questions um, that weren't answered, um, feel free to reach out to Casper directly. Um, and yeah, have a nice day, evening, um, wherever you are, morning, uh, and hopefully see you at the next meetup. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for the vivid discussion and for your interest. Uh, make sure that you actually participate in um, the community and you drive this movement. Um, and we're very much looking forward to seeing you in some of the next conversations. Maybe at PlatformCon. Absolutely. Cheers. Bye.